Okay, so I'm happy to start the second session of our workshop uh, and uh, uh, next speaker uh, is Marco Bellini. It's uh, Instituto Nazionale uh, di Otica, right? Uh, photon by photon engineering yep. on quantum of quantum light states, please. Okay, so I hope you can, uh, you can hear me. Yes. Okay, great. So first of all, uh, I'm happy to, to, to be here to participate to this uh, workshop. And uh, I'm sorry, I missed most of the morning talks because I was busy with another meeting. So well, uh, I am just uh, really happy to be here. So what I'm going to do today is to, to present some of the activities, experimental activities that uh, we are uh, carrying out in, uh, in Florence, Italy at the National Institute of Optics of the CNR. And our main activities are essentially devoted to uh, quantum optics. So let me start. So what we do, essentially what we do is to generate, manipulate, and detect exotic quantum states of light. Um, how we do it is by means of uh, uh, nonlinear optics, and in particular by the implementation of some very, uh, let's say, basic uh, quantum operations like photon addition and subtraction and uh, sequences and superpositions of these operations. And then, and why we do it? Uh, mostly we do it because it's fun, because we it's possible by means of these, uh, let's say tools uh, to, to see quantum mechanics at work uh, directly in the lab. And also because it's useful. I mean, so it's a fundamental point of view and also some, uh, uh, resources for quantum information processing and communication. Uh, so our basic, uh, uh, let's say, starting point is the Okay, so our basic starting point is, uh, let's say, the generation of single photon, herald generation of single photon. To do this, we use uh, spontaneous parametric conversion, which uh, again is non linear optics uh, technique. By means uh, starting from a high energy photon, you can split it in two photons, daughter photons, which are uh, essentially always emitted at the same time. and Conserving energy and momentum and so on. So whenever you see that a click in one of the output modes, you know that uh, there is another photon in the other one. And then you can use a setup, an experimental setup like this to detect a photon here. And sorry, to, yeah, to detect a photon here, which heralds the presence of the other photon going the other way. And then we use uh, a technique used uh, called homodyne balance homodyne detection to perform measurements on, this, uh, uh, on the states that we gener generated in this uh, herald way. Uh, so we take measurements, quadrature measurements, and after a while we collect many at different phases and we are able to reconstruct the uh, state, the quantum optical state, either by reconstructing directly the bigger function or the density matrix. And then uh, we can uh, exchange the two. Uh, besides generating single photon, we can use these tools and especially this uh, spontaneous, this parametric down conversion uh, process uh, not in a spontaneous way, just like we do with uh, for generating single photons, but in a stimulated way. So we can inject some light in this, uh, call it a signal mode. So when we do this and we see a click in the idler mode, what uh, it means is that we have essentially added exactly just one single photon to this, uh, to the input state of light. So this is a way to implement experimentally in the lab this uh, photon creation operator, ADAG. At the same time, what we can also do is to implement the photon annihilation operator A, uh, and we can do this by using a beam splitter of a low reflectivity and just detecting a photon in the reflected mode. When we see a click in this detector, we have implemented the photon annihilation operator on the input state. So both of these are non-deterministic heralded operations, so they, they, uh, they don't work all the time, but not deterministic uh, addition and subtraction of photons, but they work only when we have some herald signals uh, that tells us that uh, the operation has been successful. So we have been using this uh, for several years now. So for example, for photon addition, we have been adding single photons to, to many different kinds of, of light, starting from coherent states in this case, where we can uh, we could show some how the uh, transition, smooth transition from a particle to a wave-like 
uh, behavior of, uh, of light. And uh, uh, in this other case, we apply this to thermal states of light. And also in this case, what we see is that by, by adding just a single photon, the state becomes non-classical. In this case, you see the clear negativity of the Wigner function after the application of this ADAG, the DAG operator. Uh, concerning the photon subtraction, then uh, actually it was first experimentally uh, implemented in, uh, in a group of Philippe Granger in Paris uh, some years ago. And first it was used to degussify some uh, squeeze back in states and generate a small uh, Schrodinger cats, optical Schrodinger cats. And then we also implemented this uh, photon subtraction. And for example, we applied this to, 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 to again, thermal states of light. And we found some very uh, peculiar behavior of uh, photon statistics after the application of this uh, photon subtraction operator. Uh, not only can we, I mean, did we implement these operators uh, independently, A, DAC, and A, but then uh, in, uh, in the last uh, several years, we've been using them in combinations, so in sequences, uh, and we, are, we were also able to implement uh, coherent superpositions of these operations so that we essentially did a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, interesting basic stuff, and I'm going to show you just a few of them. So, for example, if you produce a sequence of uh, photon creation and uh, uh, annihilation one after the other, and you apply this to, to a coherent state of light to a weak coherent state of light, like in this case, uh, it, and it's easy to see that the result of this operation is essentially another coherence, another weak coherent state of light of double amplitude. What does it mean is that uh, essentially by just simply uh, implementing a sequence of photon creation and photon annihilation and applying this to a coherent state of light, you have performed a, a, a noiseless uh, amplification uh, of the state. Of course, um, this is non-deterministic because a deterministic noiseless amplification is uh, uh, forbidden by quantum mechanics, but nevertheless, this is a, an interesting uh, result which can be useful for which can be useful for, for, for even for applications. Uh, then, for example, we can, again, use our tools uh, again and implement different sequences of uh, annihilation and uh, creation. So if we if you implement them in a, let's say, inverse order, and you apply them to the same state of light, in this case, we use the uh, uh, thermal states of light and we apply either first subtraction and then uh, addition, or first addition and then subtraction, and then you can directly for example, test commutation rules because you can see, look at the result of these two inverse uh, operations in, in the inverse order. And uh, what we found was that, uh, okay, the results were different, which was a direct uh, verification of um, non commutativity of uh, uh, bosonic operators. Uh, if once you have done this, uh, I mean, what we did with that experiment was essentially to, to verify that uh, A and A DAG do not commute, but we didn't prove that per commutator was exactly one by the entity. So in order to do this, what you need is to also implement some um, coherent superposition of these operators. So how do you implement this? So this coherent superposition of operators? Well, a simple way of doing this is to, 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 to essentially build an experiment like this. And the, the, the key to this experiment is that now what you do uh, you, you mix uh, the herald modes of uh, two of these, uh, let's say, operators to two boxes. In this case, these two photon subtract subtraction operator, one before the photon creation and the other one after the photon creation operator. You mix them on a bin splitter and you look at the click after the bin splitter. So when we see a click in this detector, we don't know what's coming from the first one or the second one. And if we look for coincidences, for uh, with the photon addition, then what we can implement when we see a coincident click in this case is this uh, general coherent superposition of these uh, two sequences of uh, creation and annihilation in a reverse order. And so by just playing with the reflectivity of this bin splitter, you can change the relative weight of these two terms. And you can also change the phase here. So that allows you to adjust the, the phase of this proposition. So in particular, what we did in that case was to, to, to have a 50% bin splitter, so that you yeah, just this form, and then set the phase equal to, 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 to 
zero, yeah, to zero, so that we could really implement the photon, uh, sorry, the commutator between A and A DAG experimentally. And what we found was that indeed it behaved as expected and it was equivalent to the identity operator. Uh, so we can have a general look at these uh, operations, addition and subtraction of the photons. And uh, while photon subtraction, sub subtraction is a very interesting operation, it only um, essentially uh, can uh, produce no classicality if it was already there uh, to begin with. So for example, for the generation of Schrodinger cats, you had to start from a already non-classical uh, squeeze vacuum state to get something even more non-classical with some negativity of the Dickens function. Um, and also, I mean, if you implement coherent superpositions of uh, photon subtraction operators on different modes, you have to start from something which is already non-classical, already entangled to get something which is even more entangled. Uh, for example, you can distill entanglement by, by uh, using this kind of uh, operation. So you can increase the entanglement between two, two modes uh, by performing this coherent superposition of the single photon between the two modes. But in any case, you need to start from some, something which is already non classical or entangled to get something which is more non classical and more entangled. On the contrary, photon addition is uh, much better in this sense because it can turn any input state any classical and um, even macroscopic state into a non-classical one by just performing this photon addition operation uh, even in a single mode. Uh, but if you can, if you perform this, uh, it's a coherent superposition of photon uh, creation operators on more modes, uh, even if uh, you start from something which is completely uncorrelated, which is, which is completely classical and uh, even macroscopic, then you may expect that you get something entangled every time. So this is what we have been doing the last uh, several years. And um, I'm going to show you some of the recent results. So the way to do it is, for example, we just take two of these uh, photon addition devices again, and we can mix their uh, herald modes on a beam splitter before detection by this detector here. So when we see a click in this detector, and let's say, suppose we start from vacuum, you see, see clicking this detector that could come from the first mode. So we have one photon here and zero still there, or from the other one. And in this case, you have zero on the first one and one on the second. So since these two are indistinguishable, what you generate is this single photon path and tangle state that's one zero zero one. Okay, you can do something more interesting than this. And for example, you can do you can start from vacuum of one mode and a coherent state of the other. And again, if you do this trick, you have a coherent superposition of these two situations. One where you generate a single photon in the first mode and you're still with the same coherent state in the second mode. And the other situation where you have a vacuum in the first mode and then a photon added the coherent state in the second one. Then, okay, I'm just doing it quickly, but this kind of state has this form and it can be transformed into, into slightly something different, which is this hybrid entangled state. And this is hybrid because it uh, uh, entangles two, uh, let's say, modes, which are encoded in different uh, ways. One mode, the first one, let's say, which is uh, encoded in uh, essentially zero, one discrete variables naturally, okay? And the second mode, which is encoded in continuous variable, alpha and minus alpha. So this is interesting from, uh, let's say, fundamental point of view, but also, because it may be a, a sort of interface between uh, quantum information, let's say networks or connections, which use different encodings. Then, uh, so yeah, for, for a very recent uh, review of our experiments on this uh, coherent superposition of uh, photon additions in uh, different modes, you can have a look at this uh, paper. And our more recent experiments involved a situation where we have two coherent states now to start with. Again, we perform the same kind of uh, experiment. So we uh, perform this uh, coherent superposition of photon additions in, on the two modes. And what we find is that we adjust this phase in, in the right way, in particular when we, this phase is equal to pi, what we get is that we are able to generate entanglement and we are also able to measure entanglement between these two modes, even when the coherent state's amplitude uh, is uh, relatively large. So in principle, ideally, 
this would work. I mean, you would have a, a constant level of entanglement independently of the size of these Aquarian states here. So you could essentially generate entanglement between two macroscopic states of light. Here we do it up to something like 60 uh, photons in each Aquarian state on average, which is already rather, let's say, not so small already. If we look better at the state that we generate by this operation, then we can see that it's made of uh, two parts, one which is entangled, and uh, it's essentially just one zero, zero one state plus some uh, displacement in phase space. And another part which is completely separable here, and the ratio between these two parts is essentially given by this uh, phase here, the phase of a superposition of the photocation operators. So in the case that phi is equal to pi, these terms completely cancels. And as uh, we have seen before, in this case, I mean, we expect this entanglement to stay high forever, independently of the size of the gradient states. Uh, but, uh, but you see, I mean, this uh, it stays high, but uh, as uh, alpha grows larger, then the sensitivity on the exact, uh, let's say, uh, positioning of the phase gets stronger and stronger. So one could think of using this uh, uh, sensitivity of entanglement of this state on the remote phase here as a scheme to, 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 to really measure, uh, remotely measure a phase. And this is something that we have just uh, uh, submitted to very recently. So a scheme for remote phase sensing by this uh, coherent single photon addition. And um, these sort of states also have some uh, other interesting properties. So if you look at the uh, joint photon number distribution of the input state, these uh, separable gradient states here, what you find is uh, something like this. So uh, the probability of finding a given number of photons in one mode is uh, essentially independent of finding uh, of the number of photons that you find of the other mode. But uh, once you coherently add a single photon to these states, what you get is uh, quite different. You, you see, I mean, this uh, joint photon number distribution now has a valley, essentially it's at zero along the diagonal, which means that this state has uh, is uh, interesting uh, statistical joint statistical property, which uh, tells you that uh, um, the number of photons in each mode is uh, well essentially random, but they never get the same number of photons in the two modes. Okay, uh, well this is um, interesting, peculiar, and uh, can we do anything with this? So, well, uh, maybe yes. And uh, what we can do is uh, to to apply some 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 state like this, for example, to share some uh, unique randomness between two parties. And one common problem uh, where the, some unique randomness uh, is needed is uh, sort of a problem uh, which was named the mental poker back in 1981 by this uh, uh, Shamir Rivers uh, Edelman, who are the same ones uh, who are responsible for this uh, RSA uh, cryptographic, uh, let's say, protocol classical cryptographic protocol. And uh, the problem was really to, to play uh, poker on, on the phone, which is quite different than playing uh, chess, for example, on the phone, because in the case of chess, all the uh, pieces are just uh, visible to every partner. And so, uh, I mean, you cannot cheat. In uh, the case of poker played on the phone, you have to trust the other party, you have to trust the dealer who, who is not giving good cards to your opponent and so on. And so this kind of problem has been around for quite a long time. And uh, so these guys found some classical um, solution, which was based on uh, something similar to, 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 to cryptographic uh, technique for the exchange, let's say, of keys, uh, which is anyway uh, susceptible of, um, let's say, uh, being broken by better mathematical, let's say, algorithms. So what we could do instead uh, would be to, to use one of the states uh, to distribute uh, these two states to Ellis and Bob. And this way we would be, we would be uh, guaranteed that they receive a random and a unique uh, number each. So this is a way of dealing, let's say, cards in a, a trusted and uh, fair way. And, but it's not good only for card games, could be good for secure voting, electronic cash, and so on. Okay, so what we can do, ideally, 
these are the state the, the join photon number distribution that one would expect if we use our states this is what we get which is i mean uh, considering all experimental let's say uh, inefficiency this is quite good um, this is a pictorial representation of this kind of uh, scheme uh, so what we uh, just uh, just shortly, what we can also do is to, to, to not just to, to engineer the, the state of, a, of light, but we can also engineer the, the mode of light. So we suppose we have just a single photons. Uh, normally, we use the ultra short single photons in our labs. What we can also do is to, to engineer their spectral temporal shape. And uh, we can do this in different ways. And for example, we can use uh, uh, resonant atomic gases to, 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 to interact with, uh, with our ultra short single photon pulses. And what we find is that we can essentially just uh, shape uh, the, the, the mode of the single photon. We still have a single photon out, but it has uh, a completely different shape. And we can uh, essentially detect and characterize this, sh this shape and say photons by means of, of uh, our homodyne detection. And in particular, what we can do is to shape the uh, local oscillator of the, our homotone detection in a well-known way. And so essentially match the shape of a local oscillator to the shape of a uh, single photons that we want to measure. Okay, let me conclude. So I hope that I show you some, how we essentially play with quantum light. And uh, what we do in our labs is really essentially playing with the basic, uh, tools of quantum mechanics with uh, basic operators, with, with basic quantum rules, uh, with uh, interesting uh, objects uh, that in quantum in optics are just a uh, superposition of equivalent states of uh, opposite phases. And so what we do is uh, in arbitrary engineering of quantum light states, uh, we perform these uh, textbook uh, type experiments and fundamental quantum, quantum tests. We can generate and control entanglement we can uh, essentially morph or just shape in, uh, in the spectrum temporal domain of single photons. And all these tools can be in principle used for, for quantum technologies. Uh, as I showed you, some noise certification, remote sensing, quantum information processing, and communication protocols. So this is all. These are the people who have been most, most recently uh, and collaborated with me. And if you want some more information, you can look at this website. And okay, we are working at this uh, institute, National Institute of, of Optics, but we are in a collaboration with the University of the Florence and with the LENS, which is the European Laboratory for Nonlinear Spectroscopy, also in Florence. And we had support from some European projects for these uh, experiments. Okay, so I think this is all. I hope I'm in time. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Marco, for, for interesting talk. Uh, time you. for question. Uh, first, uh, I, uh, I, I, uh, I I plan to uh, to ask questions from the chat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, question one, I see, uh, Vadim Fedukovic, any teleportation scheme out of uh, DVCV entanglement? Question mark. Okay, yes, of course. I mean, this uh, hybrid uh, DVCV um, entanglement can be used for, for teleporting uh, a qubit, for example, from uh, the discrete variable encoding to the continuous variable encoding or vice versa. And people have already been doing some experiments in this, uh, in this direction. For example, people of, uh, uh, in Paris, uh, the group of Julien Gourat. And uh, so very, this is, I mean, one of the main interests of this kind of uh, hybrid states, that the fact that they can be used as an interface between, let's say, parts of, uh, of a network which are encoded in different ways. So discrete variables or continuous variable, and you can use teleportation to, to, to translate from one encoding to the other. Okay, uh, and another question uh, from uh, the same guy. Uh, any algorithms suggested out of photon number non-correlation may be comparable to algorithms from Bell states, question mark. Uh, I, 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 okay, I have to, to, to read the question because I'm not sure that I understood, Maybe. sorry. Let's see if I can, I don't know, suggest a lot of photon. Hmm. 
Okay, I, I, I don't know how to answer this question, really. I'm not an expert in this field. Uh, I mean, we, we generated these uh, states and we found that they had these very uh, interesting uh, statistical properties. And then we, well, we, we learned about some possible applications. I'm not sure uh, if maybe there are better ones, better, better let's say, uh, kinds of... Uh, tests of measurements to, to generate these uh, uh, non-correlated uh, random numbers. I'm not, I'm okay. not sure about this. Okay, okay, thank you. I see two hands from the experts in this field. So Vadim, please. Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, so my question is, you mentioned that uh, photon subtraction decreases the amount of non-classicality and uh, the entanglement, but how do you measure the non-classicality or entanglement of state? So what is the indicator of this phenomenon? Okay, I mean, uh, if it depends. You can use different uh, uh, different approaches uh, for for measuring non classicality. What well, what I was telling you is, for example, that uh, you can use uh, let's say negativity of of the Wigner function. I mean, which is not an absolute measurement of non classicality, but by using photon subtraction, you can start from something which has no negativity, like a squeeze vacuum state. And generate negativity of the Wigner function. So let's say somehow you increase uh, uh, non classicality of the state by using this uh, operation. And also, and if you concern entanglement, you can use different measurements of entanglement. What we do normally use is to, we perform a modern detection of it of a different modes uh, at the same time. So we reconstruct the global density matrix of the state. And then we perform a partial transpose. Uh, we measure the negativity of the, of the partial transpose as a, let's say, quantitative measurement of, uh, uh, of entanglement, which is not the only one, of course. But uh, I mean, you can use this. We use this. OK, thank you. Andre? Yeah, so thank you. Can you hear me first? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Marco. First of all, thank you for a very nice presentation. I really yeah. like it. So, Marco, my equation may be a little bit standard to your things. Um, can you somehow characterize the ability of your Herald uh, detector to distinguish between numbers of photons? I mean, so can you be sure that uh, when you have a click from such a detector, this is one photons, but not two photons, three photons? So when we want, for example, something to calculate for your uh, experimental setup, so mm -hmm. can you be sure that this is one photon, but with some probability, not two photons or three photons? No, no, we have a no, 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 no guarantee that. I mean, our photon uh, detectors are just uh, avalanche photodiodes, so we have no resolving power, uh, no photon number resolving power, and so uh, where. Whenever we, we perform our experiments, we try, we always try to, to, to stay in the safe, uh, let's say, region where, the, the, for example, the reflectivity, in the case of, uh, let's say, photon subtraction, the reflectivity of the beam splitter is low enough that the probability uh -huh. of uh, subtracting more than one photon is uh, negligible. And uh, also for the photon addition, I mean, that's, uh, that's natural because the, the probability of success is always so low that. Uh, uh, really adding more than one photon is really uh, unlikely. Uh, and then, of course, we have to, to start with uh, some uh, um, input uh, states, which are not too, uh, too, 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 too intense. The mean number of photons in the input state uh, shouldn't be too large. So we have no guarantee that we, we can, uh, uh, we are really measuring or really sub subtracting or adding a single photon, but we try to, to make the probability of uh, subtracting or adding more than one negligible all the time. Mm. Okay, thank so you very think, much. I, yeah. yeah. So okay. <laughs> this is uh, our approach. <laughs> okay, just because you use not really intense light. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm maybe due to time limitation. I just uh, one question uh, from me. Uh, so you you mentioned uh, you you said that you can uh, you can form shape uh, any shape of uh, photon in time domain. So yeah. the question is uh, maybe complex. So so uh, it is in the homodyne scheme, uh, or, or you need more advanced scheme it is first question second question about this the same so it is uh, it is the same for face space you can you can do the same in the face space 
okay, uh, concerning the, the shaping of the uh, single photons. So uh, actually what we use Omodyne just for the detection, uh, to, to detect a, a single photon in a particular shape. Uh, uh, for shaping the single photons, we can use different approaches. We can either, uh, let's say, shape the single photon uh, what we did was just, for example, we have, there are, let's say, ultra short uh, wave packets. So we just use dispersion in a, in a piece of glass, essentially, or in a piece of fiber. And at the end, we, we see this, uh, let's say, um, dispersed single photon. And then what we use homodyne uh, uh, detection with, uh, we also use genetic algorithms in the, for shaping the local oscillator and to optimize the, uh, the, the efficiency of uh, homodyne detection. So if we optimize that, it means that at the end of the optimization, the shape of the local oscillator is uh, as close as possible to the shape of our, uh, let's say, single photons. And these single photons can be shaped this way and they, we can also shape them. We also did that, uh, for example, okay, again, passing through a, a resonant medium, we used a cell with a cesium vapor, uh, resonant with the 786 uh, uh, wavelength of our single photons, uh, or we can also shape actively the, the, uh, the, the, the spectral or temporal shape of the pump that we use for down conversion. So there are different ways for shaping the single photons. Is uh, we have some uh, some uh, space to play with this. Uh, concerning the phase space. Uh, uh, the phase space, I mean, shaping in the phase space uh, is uh, essentially what we do when we engineer the, the, the state. I mean, really performing this photon addition and subtraction, we are really able to, 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 uh, to change the phase uh, space uh, distribution of the quadratures of our state, let's say. So I, I, I'm not sure that I'm answering your yeah, question. Ma, ma, maybe, uh, question uh, maybe the question behind of it, I, I, I wanted to ask uh, the following. May we expect uh, that uh, it will be available soon the tool which, uh, with which you can shape, uh, say, shape the sh uh, make the shape of the photon, like, like, for example, from Fourier component or from wavelength, wavelength? Yes, I think that would be possible, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, really, uh, um, probably the best trick for doing this is to really shape the pump of uh, for, for down conversion. And uh, you can use uh, tools that, uh, that you normally use in ultra fast optics uh, by, by pulse shapers and uh, really in a, that work in the, in, the free, in the spectral, let's say, you can just disperse spatially and then uh, you can uh, adjust each component, uh, each spectral component uh, separately. And then use this uh, shaped pump to generate the, our let's say, single photons by spontaneous chromatic down conversion. And then your single photons, if you do things carefully enough, essentially acquire the spectral shape of your of, of a pump. So in this way, you could do it. Okay, uh, I see the additional question from Andre. No, no, not question. Maybe just uh, additional comment to your question. I, I understand you mean maybe not really face space that uh, Professor Benini mean, but face space position wave vectors for single. Oh, okay. In that case, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, in principle, you can do that probably. Uh, mm, Normally, it's easy. I mean, if you, especially if you want to use them, these uh, quantum states for some, let's say, quantum information, quantum communication tasks, it's uh, maybe better if you use a single spatial mode so that it can be uh, transmitted in fibers and it's, it's easier. Uh, and then, I mean, uh, but, but in principle, you can do this. I mean, you can also spatially uh, shape our single, the single photons. And then you would need a specially shaped local oscillator to detect it. Okay, thank you. Uh, if, You're welcome. If, if there are any any more question? questions, questions, uh, then we thanks Marco again. I stop the recording.